Hey guys, in today's video, we're gonna be doing a thorough comparison of three different soil types to show you what is the best soil to grow microgreens, which ones uh, maybe make sense and which ones probably don't make sense to grow microgreens. So we have three soil recipes here that are commonly used in microgreens growing practice. We're gonna do a taste comparison, a yield comparison, a visual comparison and see what is the best solution for you guys to grow microgreens profitably at home or in a commercial facility uh, that is scalable to make your business as profitable as possible. So if you guys don't know who I am, my name is Jonah and I founded one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Uh, over the last decade, I grew it from a small little tiny farm in my parents' spare bedroom to become one of Canada's largest. I've grown over a quarter million trays of microgreens uh, my farm was planting over 2 million seeds a week um, and I found a way to scale it, make it really profitable and I actually sold my business last year to focus on educating you so that you guys can take the best information that I've learned over the last decade and take that to the next level. And yeah, let's get right into it. I want to showcase to you guys what is the best soil to use to grow microgreens commercially for profit. So the three soil recipes I used for this experiment is number one, just coconut coir on its own. Uh, number two, coconut coir with the Gaia Green fertilizer added in to give some nutrition. And then three, the super soil recipe, which is the Pro Mix plus the Gaia Green. Uh, and if anyone's looking for that specific recipe, you can download it in our free microgreens growing guide at microgreensconsulting.com. So all three of these trays were seeded and top coated with the Little Green Seeding Machine, which one, makes it much more efficient. Uh, to actually seed your trays, but two, you can get a much more even growth. So you don't have spots where there's tons of seeds and spots where there's not a lot of seed. And then it also makes top coating if you do use vermiculite an absolute breeze. So um, we seeded all three of them with uh, 21.5 grams of red ramble radish seed. So all three are the same variety. They don't look like it because they've grown very differently depending on the soil. Um, and I talk about this a lot in the podcast with other farms and um, you know, on, on this YouTube channel of how important the soil is uh, if you're going to be growing microgreens commercially because it makes such a difference. So trying to save money on soil is not always the best way to go. It can be if it just happens to work out that the best soil is the cheapest. But in my experience, just like seed, if you cheap out on seed or you cheap out on soil, you're going to get a subpar crop and it's actually going to cost you more uh, then it's going to save you because you're going to have much lower yields and a much lower quality product. So a lot of growers use coconut coir and I would love it to be the best solution. So I came into this experiment very unbiased. I wanted to see what would work best. And, uh, you know, I don't really care if, you know, the super soil recipe is not the best recipe because I would just modify it to make a new super soil recipe that's even better. So uh, I'm pretty open to experimenting uh, with different recipes because I, the more experiments I do, the better I can make a soil recipe that I can share with you guys to uh, accelerate your growth in your business and get more from the same number of trays, which means you're gonna have more profit uh, per tray and per you know hour of time that you're spending in your business. So we'll start off just by doing a visual comparison. So this tray, uh, the, the first thing that stands out is a lot more purple. So this is just the coconut coir in the center here and you can see it's just significantly more purple, uh, but at the same time, also significantly smaller, like the leaf size, all, to be honest, looks about half or two thirds of the super soil recipe and maybe about roughly half of the coconut coir with Gaia Green. So that's the first thing right off the bat. It's a lot smaller, but also a lot more purple. So it's got a nicer color tone to it. Um, now comparing, comparing the uh, coconut coir with Gaia to the super soil recipe, uh, right off the bat, I can see that the crop is bigger with the super soil recipe. So the leaves are much bigger. Um, maybe it's got a sim probably similar, num uh, similar amount of red versus green. Um, and the tray is a little bit taller like the crop is a little bit taller in the super soil recipe and the leaves are maybe 30, 40% bigger, something like that. Um, so right off the bat, you know, I would guess that the super soil would have the highest yield and the coconut coir on its own would have the lowest yield, but we're going to actually harvest them and see if that's actually true because I don't actually know. Um, but to start off, we're going to do a taste comparison because in my experience, coconut coir gives a different flavor to crops than using like a peat based uh, soil mix like Pro Mix HP. So it'll be interesting to see what the flavor is. So we'll just take a, you know, a random sample of a, of a couple leaves in here and try the coconut coir one first. It's pretty mild. 
Um, some of the other experiments I've done in the past, I've noticed a sharper flavor when there's no fertilizer. So it's interesting that it's not super sharp flavor with this radish. It's pretty tender, so it's not um, super fibrous. And overall, the flavor is good. I would eat that. I would buy this in a store. <clears throat> it does have a slight salty flavor to it, so it's not um, it's not super super mild. Uh, so next, we'll try the coconut coir with Gaia Green fertilizer. So I'll eat a few leaves here. So this one a lot crunchier. Uh, it feels like the leaves have more density to them. It actually is less fibrous. Like this one definitely has some, you know, more fiber. Now, having said that, it's still pretty fiberless, you know, compared to you know, mature uh, radish leaves or, or, you know, any sort of salad green. Um, there, I would say there's similar spiciness level. Uh, it felt like it was like just cruncher, it had more juice, it had more water in it, uh, which leads me to think that, you know, it's probably gonna yield more than this one. And then lastly, let's try the uh, Super Soul recipe and see what this one tastes like compared to those two. So I would say it's probably similar level of crunchiness. Maybe it's even slightly less crunchy than the coconut coir. Um, the flavor is quite different. So it still tastes like radish, but it doesn't have that salty flavor um, that these two have. So, which, which is kind of what I thought because coconut coir is generally, most of it that you buy is comes from Sri Lanka um, or India, that area. And uh, they don't have a ton of freshwater resources to utilize. So they often wash the coconut husks after they harvest them in like a brackish water. So it can have a higher salt content, which for radish doesn't really affect the crop. But if you try to grow like basil or dill uh, or cilantro, it may have a bigger impact on the growth uh, and the flavor, especially for things like herbs, because, uh, you know, I've grown coconut coir and dill in the past and it's crazy how much salt it can absorb. It's actually nuts. So you can actually like taste in the, by growing in a coconut coir, the salt content in the soil. Uh, which is really interesting. But in this scenario, it's not like a major difference. Like I can tell flavor wise the difference, but as a, you know, a consumer, I don't realistically, I don't think anyone's gonna be able to tell the difference between these three, uh, except for the visual of the color on just the coconut coir. And my guess is the reason it's more purple is it's just less developed. You can see the leaves are smaller. And if these ones were grown uh, you know, for four days instead of seven days or something like that, it would probably be this purple as well. So it just looks like it's a bit stunted because it doesn't have fertilizer, um, which, you know, I've talked about this a lot on the podcast, uh, in other videos like this, how important using a high quality fertilizer is for growing microgreens. Um, and, you know, it, it, this kind of shows how different the size is. Uh, and we'll see what the yields, which we'll get to next as to what is the difference between these three trays of microgreens and how they're grown. So let's get to that. All right, so we're gonna harvest these three trays of microgreens uh, and then the other ones as well that I have growing uh, because you know if you grow one tray, it may not be a good indicator of the growth. So we're gonna do um, you know multiple trays of each one and take the average yield of those to get a better indication of uh, the yield of the crop for each uh, specific soil recipe. So we're gonna start with the super soil recipe and start harvesting it. And as always, you wanna use a sharp knife to harvest your microgreens. If you have a quick cut greens harvester, that will save you a ton of time. I highly recommend anyone growing like pretty much over 25 trays a week to uh, purchase a quick cut greens harvester. It's about $1,000 and it pays for itself like well under a year, especially if you value your time correctly. Um, you know, as a business owner, you can go spend that time getting sales or other things. So I highly, highly recommend to get a quick cut greens harvester. But today we're just gonna use uh, old fashioned uh, sharp knife to cut the microgreens and see what the yield is. All right, so we have the results of the yield test, which of course is pretty much the most important part of this experiment because uh, most of you guys is, are gonna wanna get the most yield possible out of your trays. 
So keep in mind that uh, I'm very much a quality focused microgreen grower. So I didn't cut the stems all the way right to the base. If I did, there would have been an even bigger significant difference than there was between the trays because you only can cut so far down a tray. And, uh, and then, you know, the bigger they grow, generally the more stem they're gonna have as well. But I, I like to keep the stems on the shorter side because uh, it'll make it a lot easier to sell the product and all the nutrition for the most part is in the leaf, not the stem. So I always encourage people to not cut super long stems. You don't want soup noodles. Uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna sell noodles, then start a different business. If you wanna sell microgreens, cut your stems uh, to an appropriate length. And if anyone is unsure of you know, what is an appropriate length, Johnny's Seeds has a really good, uh, I don't wanna say guide, but if you go on their website and just search the specific crop, so in this case, red rambo radish, they'll show you what like in the picture where, where you can purchase the seeds, what a normal sized radish microgreen looks like. Uh, so it'll help people that are new to the industry kind of get a sense of what is considered a good length stem for every crop because it's, it's kind of like a leaf to stem ratio. Um, and over time you kind of get a sense of, you know, what is optimal and then also customers will give you feedback. So if you sell the chefs, uh, they'll probably tell you, Hey, this is like not uh, a good stem length. This is way too long. Uh, you know, this is not going to look uh, appropriate on our dishes that we are selling. So, uh, so first off, you can see the bags are obviously very differently filled. So we had three trays of each crop and I took the average of the three. So first off, we'll start with uh, coconut coir, which, um, you know, the, I cut the stems, I, I don't want to say as long as I could, because uh, I want it to be a fair comparison, but I cut them uh, lower down on the trays than, than these two, because they were so much shorter. So uh, it would have been like crazy low if I cut the, the, the same height off the tray. So the coconut coir on its own without fertilizer got 141 grams for the tray which is definitely on the lower end for radish. Uh, now, normally you can grow these longer. So like, obviously if you were growing the coconut coir, you probably maybe would harvest it at like nine or 10 days just because of how much slower it's growing. But at the same time, it's still, it wouldn't catch up to the other two because it's just the limiting factor, the weakest link in the production was having fertilizer for this tray, which is why it stayed so much shorter in the same amount of time. Um, and then on top of that, you're gonna be spending more money on electricity uh, the, the actual space that you're growing in, you can't have a seven day cycle. You have to have, let's say a 10 day cycle as an example, if you uh, did this, so you get less crops per year. Um, but to keep it simple, let's just say this, like, you know, a fair comparison, this was seven days, you got 141 grams. Uh, the next was the, the coconut coir with the guy green fertilizer, which this one actually really surprised me. This one only got 151 gra uh, 152 grams on average per uh, tray and it looks a lot more um, and I think these are just very dense because the leaves are smaller. My, my guess is again with this weakest link model that I use to help people understand how to optimize their production, if the soil itself, the coconut coir is the weakest link in the production so you have really high quality lights, you have good fertilizer, good temperature, good humidity, uh, you know appropriate light levels, everything else is good but the soil the soil will be the limiting factor. So even if you have the fertilizer in, if the soil itself is the weakest link, it won't have much of an impact, which is what kind of showcased in this. Like I would, like you can see the leaves are definitely bigger, uh, but it didn't actually yield that much more, uh, which was actually surprising me. But based on my understanding of uh, growing crops, like whatever is the weakest link will be the determining factor for growth. So uh, if you have everything perfect, but the soil, then, you still won't have a, a good quality product or yield because uh, that is the weakest link and it will limit the amount of, for example, fertilizer that can be absorbed in the soil if the soil itself is not appropriate uh, medium to grow the crop. Now, the last uh, tray was a super soil recipe, which is the ProMix HP with the Guy Green fertilizer. And this got 247 grams per tray on average. So as you can see, pretty significant difference. Um, and you know, you're talking about pretty much hundred grams more per tray uh, by switching out the soil. And the soil itself, you know, uh, coconut coir is actually more expensive than ProMix if you account for um, what you're actually getting per, per bag or per bale. Uh, and, and then on top of that, you have, if you're using the compressed bricks for coconut coir, those things are an absolute pain in the butt. 
uh, to decompress and to wet. So um, it's a lot slower of a process than using ProMix HP. So there's also an additional labor cost on top of the additional cost of the material. Um, having said that, it is, in my opinion, a more sustainable uh, growing medium in terms of uh, you know, the environmental impact of harvesting peat moss versus harvesting coconut coir. Uh, but if you're in North America, you, you know, coconut coir is coming from literally the other side of the world where peat moss is coming from can mostly from Canada. So there's much less of a shipping impact um, by using peat moss, but there's, you know, a, a bigger carbon sink by using peat moss because of how uh, efficient of a carbon, of a carbon capture uh, peat bogs are. So, but having said that, if you have to use twice as much material because you're getting, you know, half the yield, then is it really more sustainable? And my answer is no. It's because you're using more electricity, you're using more fertilizer, you're using uh, more resources just in general, more soil. So you have to use more to get the same yield, which means that you're actually probably using more resources and having a bigger carbon uh, uh, impact, which is why I always recommend maximizing uh, yields uh, assuming you can keep the quality high, like you don't want to maximize yields and affect quality because it's going to make it a lot harder to sell the product and scale your business. Now, if you compare, uh, if we take this one out of the equation and you compare coconut coir, which is a lot of growers use this in and of itself and just don't add fertilizer and that's what they grow with. Um, and if you compare that to the pro mix, you're getting an extra 54% yield. Uh, doing the same amount of work, actually less work, because it's easier to break up the HP uh, soil than it is the coconut coir. So you're actually getting some labor savings as well. Um, but you're on top of that, you're also getting labor savings because you're getting more yield per tray. So you can grow less trays and get the same or more yield, um, which is you know a, a pretty big benefit for those that are trying to scale up their business because you know. The more labor you have to, sp or more time you have to spend on growing the trays, the less time you have to sp you have to spend uh, growing the business and getting more sales. And this is where tools like the Quick Cut Greens Harvester and the Logan Seeding Machine make such a big difference because it saves you as the business owner time that you can spend on getting sales for the business, improving the production systems, like switching potentially to the Super Soil recipe and getting higher yields and saving time. So. Um, you know, this is what I kind of do on a daily basis is trying to teach people this. Um, now, if you're selling retail and you're selling, um, you know, direct to consumer, you're selling a 75 gram clamshell of radish for $6, which is a pretty fair across the board in North America price point. Some people charge a lot more than that. Um, but let's just say, use that price point. If you were to switch from coconut coir to the uh, super soul recipe, you'd be making an extra $8.48 of profit per tray. So you're gonna be getting like about 1.4, 1.5 uh, extra, actually 1.54 because it's 54% higher yield. So 1.54 uh, more clamshells per tray than you would with the coconut coir. So that pays for uh, you know so many things that you can spend the, that money on uh, either to pay yourself or to expand the business. And then that's just one tray. So if you take like you growing 100 trays a week, that you're talking about $848 per week uh, of extra profit. So this can be a, a huge advantage for microgreens farms that utilize the super soul recipe. Um, the reason I wanted to make this video is because there are a lot of growers uh, using coconut coir and there's so much information on these Facebook groups and uh, you know just YouTube videos saying coconut coir is a great growing medium uh, and also hemp mats which I made another video if anyone wants to see the difference between hemp mats and super soil there's a video on my channel on that to do uh, a comparison on that um, but coconut coir is way more popular than the hemp mats and as you can see uh, you know with this sp specific crop of radish which is actually an easier crop to grow than the more finicky crops like basil and cilantro, which would probably, in my estimate, have an even bigger impact uh, because they are longer term crops. So uh, this is, to me, a no brainer into you know, what to utilize for your business. Uh, you know, there's a reason that I was able to expand my farm to the size that it was growing you know, 1,500 trays a week uh, because I was using a soil recipe like this. So the profit margins allowed me to not have to run the business on a daily basis and hire staff and focus on growing the business and even more importantly, spending leisure time on things that I wanted to do instead of uh, the grind that most people find themselves in once they scale up a microgreens business. So uh, using, utilizing tools 
like the quick cut greens harvester, the little green seeding machine, utilizing good soil recipes like the super soil recipe and, um, and having really good systems in place will make such a difference for making it easy to run a microgreens business. And again, as I said in the beginning of the video, I want you guys to take what I have here and take it to the next level. So start with the super soil recipe and then improve it, make it even better. Make your own super soil recipe that's even better than this and take the next generation of microgreens farms to the next level in efficiency, in yield and quality. And, uh, and that's what I'd love to see. So I want, I want you guys as much as you can to improve on what I have done um, and, uh, and you know, help revolutionize the industry, be able to feed more people with less resources. Like that's what we need in the world. And by doing things like this and using a really high quality soil, we will be able to do that much faster um, and much more efficiently than if we you know, continue to use uh, the status quo of things like coconut coir that just don't really provide uh, the right balance of profitability, yield, quality that you would want to be a commercial grower in the microgreens industry and just in general. So for example, I've used the super soil recipe uh, to grow pepper plants and the yields have been insane. Like I, there was one year we grew uh, and it wasn't even a warm summer. Like I live in Canada, so it gets not that hot in the summer to grow uh, peppers. We were able to grow 200, it was around 240, 250 peppers off one plant in a short Canadian summer using this recipe. So while it works for microgreens, it also works for outdoor crops. So this is a great recipe to use if you're growing tomatoes in your garden, uh, you're growing salad greens indoors or outdoors, growing uh, any, pretty much anything. I put it on my, my Japanese maples and all sorts of ornamental trees and they kind of just take off. So um, this recipe is amazing for all sorts of plants. Um, and yeah, and I hope you guys can utilize the information here to improve your business. Thanks so much for watching. Again, if you want to download the free microgreens growing guide, you can do so at microgreensconsulting.com. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.